Hey, how's it going, everybody? Um, just made a few edits to my other video. I got some feedback, so I added a couple of slides to kind of help uh, drive the point home a little better. And so I'm just going to redo the whole video with those slides included. So if you see a couple of things that are the same, it's probably because they are. But I just added a couple of pictures to kind of help things make a little more sense from uh, people who don't see vents on the regular and hopefully this will help make a little more sense. So we're just going to do uh, more mechanical ventilation, um, invasive and non-invasive. And um, just to recap, I've been doing respiratory therapy here in Florida for the last five years. Um, I work at a level two trauma center, so I've spent pretty much my entire time doing uh, trauma, emergency medicine, and critical care, um, cardiovascular ICU, um, just nothing with the NICU and the PICU. So anything on the adult side, I've pretty much done. Um, but anyways, let's get into it. So today we're just going to talk about indications for mechanical ventilation, the modes of ventilation, um, how to you know read the orders, uh, weaning parameters, and then just basic ventilator management stuff. So during negative ventilation versus positive ventilation, you know, our diaphragm drops, the air goes in, gas exchange happens, the diaphragm goes up, and then the air goes out, and then we just repeat autonomically. Uh, during positive pressure ventilation, you know, the ventilator pushes the diaphragm down, the gas exchange occurs, the pressure goes down, uh, and then the gas goes out, and it repeats uh, as long as the machine allows it. So... Why do we uh, get put on a mechanical ventilator? Um, just three reasons, really. Uh, you don't oxygenate, you don't ventilate, and you can't protect your airway. Um, if you would like to pause and um, take some notes on uh, the different reasons why, um, I'm not going to read them off. That would just take too long. But uh, this slide and the next slide are all about um, just some of the reasons why people would be um, intubated and put on a ventilator. The most important one is at the very bottom, chronic complainers. Um, you know, sometimes you just need a little bit of quiet in your day, but you never say the Q word. So non-invasive mechanical ventilation, this is your BiPAP and your CPAP patients. Um, most common reasons why are listed here, you know, sleep apnea. Um, it's now the first line of defense against COPD exacerbations. Uh, we can do it with bilateral pneumonias just because of the difficulty oxygenating. Um, I see in the ER, you know, the congestive heart failure with pulmonary edema all the time. And some, and we do see on occasion, you know, your myasthenia gravis and your Guillain-Barre's. And you can put them on mechanical, um, non-invasive mechanical ventilation to try and hopefully get them over the hump so that way they don't have to be intubated. Um, but, you know, I've seen it go in both directions. Um, acute lung injuries, these are like your traumas. Um, we do a lot of CPAP with uh, rib fractures. It's called pneumatic intercostal stabilization. And it just reduces the movement of the fractured ribs um, so that way it's hopefully more comfortable for the patient while they're recovering from that lung uh, healing process. And also in trauma we've done um, as a weaning measure from being intubated, if someone's kind of on the fence of whether they could could be extubated or not, um, we sometimes you give them a shot on CPAP or BiPAP, and and if they do well, uh, you can move them down to like a flow based, you know, aerosol face mask or a venti or something of that nature, and hopefully get them weaned down to two liters or room air if the possibility arises. So contraindications, you know, respiratory arrest or unstable, you know, cardiorespiratory status, they can't cooperate. Uh, these are the people who say they're claustrophobic or they can't tolerate it. Um, you can't protect your airway. Um, you don't want patients to aspirate. Uh, trauma or burns to the face. Um, it would be incredibly painful if you had facial fractures and then you had that tight mask squeezing on that, uh, you know, orbital fracture or whatever. Uh, facial, esophageal, gastric surgery. These are your gastric bypasses or anything of that nature. Um, people that can't breathe on their own, any sort of apnea, whether it's preferably central. Um, obstructive sleep apnea is one of the reasons actually why you get put on BiPAP or CPAP. Um, reduced consciousness because 
spontaneous respirations are kind of the whole point of having them on there versus intubation, or if they have a pneumac, a pneumothorax due to uh, some sort of air leak. So using pressure, time, and oxygen, um, and in some cases volume, um, we can help ventilate, oxygenate, and rec you know recruit under profuse segments of the lungs with you know atelectasis, right? So we use do that with uh, CPAP or constant positive airway pressure. And these are people who have sleep apnea. You know we do a lot in the PACU for patients that already have sleep apnea, just as a you know until they can wake up more. And then, you know, like I said in the last slide, you know, the bridge between extubation and, you know, other delivery devices like, you know, aerosol face masks or nasal cannula. And it only oxygenates and not ventilates. Um, and this, the pressure is still the same during both inhalation and exhalations. It just helps retor restore and maintain FRC, recruits alveoli, improves your VQ matching, and it helps prevent, you know, obstructive sleep apnea. And that's in the non-invasive mode, not on intubated patients. And then we also can do it for uh, trach patients who are being weaned off the ventilator entirely. Uh, these are usually for your longer term uh, trauma patients or whatever the case may be. And then BiPAP uses two levels of pressure, IPAP and EPAP, which is inspiratory positive airway pressure versus expiratory positive airway pressure to help ventilate and oxygenate the patient. It allows for a decrease in their overall work of breathing. And like I said, we use this in the first line of defense of COPD patients with a pH of 7.2 or greater. And then we can use it if the CPAP isn't effective. Um, usually, sometimes you can put them on a low-grade BiPAP um, if CPAP isn't working, it's just everybody's different. Um, my motto for BiPAP is comfortable yet functional. Um, there's no point of putting them on some crazy settings if they can't wear the mask. So if you can keep it in a comfortable yet functional manner and you're still making progress, then go for it. Um, but initially setting it up, you set your IPAP to anywhere from 10 to 15 centimeters of pressure. Uh, your EPAP is usually between 5 and 7, and then whatever that difference is, you know, that's your overall pressure support. And then you can use pressure support to help supplement your tidal volume. And then usually you do an ABG before, if possible. If you can, it's okay. And then just do an ABG with within a certain amount of time of placing them on it, and then usually within an hour or two afterwards. Um, I always, when I put them on it, if they are able to tolerate, I usually kind of have them give me a thumbs up or some gesture to let me know if they're doing okay. Um, and a lot of times it, it, it helps because you need them to wear it. That's the whole point. So in this, for the case of this lecture, the BiPAP didn't work. So now we're, you're being intubated. So invasive mechanical ventilation or just mechanical ventilation or uh, in some cases it's called the breathing machine. So here we are. So we have a lot of options, whether it's assist control, SIMV, just pressure support or CPAP. Uh, you can also do bi-level or APRV, uh, same thing. And or you can just use volume control or pressure control. So the, what we always want to ask ourselves is what do we want to be in control of? You know, every physician has reasons for managing the ventor, ventilator the way that they do. And it's all really dependent on their training of where they went and did their residency and fellowship. Um, and the same thing is how respiratory therapists are done. If, you know, I was told by an RT once there's a hundred different ways to treat a patient chances are 99 of them probably won't hurt but it, you know it's all preference really um and just depending on the patient's you know injury physiology just overall status you know it's why we change what we do and just to keep in mind if you're using volume control pressure will be variable and vice versa if pressure controls being used now if you have a patient with very low static compliance which is the amount of volume you get for one centimeter of pressure, if that number is low, you're going to have high pressures if you're using volume control in order to ventilate the patient. Now, in the era of lung protective ventilation, you don't want to give them a pneumo or cause barotrauma or something of that nature. It defeats the purpose. So you can use pressure control and give them lower tidal volumes and control your minute ventilation that way. 
and uh, hopefully you're not dead spacing them too much to where it's not working for them. And that's just kind of what it looks like. You see the pressure waveform just being more of the slanted shape versus the flat shape of pressure control, and that's what it is. You're keeping the pressure constant. Um, the volume is changing. It's just the way the waveforms are. You'll see them more when you um, actually using the ventilator. I just found this picture on, on Google last night. I wanted a PB840, but it was hard to find a find good pictures so this is just a generic photo I had found so when you're using assist control you know you can set the minimum rate you can set your volume or pressure um, the patient can initiate a breath over the set rate if they're able to and every volume has a set volume or set pressure and then like I said your pressures vary for volume control the tidal volume varies if using pressure control in this mode you cannot use uh, pressure support you can use PEEP, um, older RTs and docs sometimes call PEEP CPAP. It's the same thing, it's just how it's being used. And the major takeaway is all breaths are the same. Now generally speaking, if you have a patient who's not necessarily hemodynamically stable, if you're looking to kind of track and trend their ABGs, by keeping all the breaths the same, you can control their minute ventilation and overall mean airway pressures for oxygenation's sake. And that way you can hopefully get your ABGs where you want them to be while hopefully the patient's improving over time. So SIMV, it's synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. Um, you set a minimum rate, you set your volume pressure, the patient is able to breathe spontaneously over it, that's the whole point of it. So you can give them variable volumes using the pressure support in addition to the set mechanical stuff you're giving them now it's you can still use peep and CPAP here you know if the breaths are spaced far enough apart you know the the, the vent will kick in and give them a mandatory breath um, one of the reasons why you use SIMV is for longer term um, vent patients uh, pretty much every anesthesiologist I ever work with the only reason the only mode they really use is SIMV it's just how they're trained. Um, but usually with SIMV, you set them at a lower rate to let them breathe spontaneously so they can still work their diaphragm, and that's where the pressure support um, is important. So PRVC or VC plus APV just depends on what ventilator you're using. Um, this one, you set the rate. You set a target tidal volume. You set a time. You set a pressure limit or a pop-off pressure. You set, you know, your FiO2 and everything like you do in every other mode. Uh, you set your PEEP. In this mode, generally you don't use pressure support. Um, it, you're allowing the the this mode to measure your overall static compliance, and the ventilator itself manages the pressures to help maintain that target tidal volume. Um, this is one of the lung protective ventilation modes that we use pretty much constantly now except in a few conditions like ARDS or something of that nature. It just depends on, on the doctor and like I said why they do what they do. So pressure support ventilation or PSV, this is basically BiPAP on a ventilator. Um, it's just you set whatever pressure support you want to use and everything varies because the patient does essentially really whatever they want to do. You can also peep them up if you need to, but the primary purpose of this is it's a mode of extubation or it's a weaning mode for trach patients to help get them off the ventilator. And we can change our pressure support to help overcome the resistance of having an endotracheal tube or tracheostomy. You know, if you think of it in anatomical sense, your trachea is roughly about the size of a quarter in diameter. So if you put an 80 ET tube down someone, you're essentially restricting their their flow by a th you know their volume by a third, right? So you know they, that comes you know thanks to Hooke's law that increases resistance of air moving through. So you can give them that press support to help overcome that resistance of having that tube in until they can get that tube out. So here's bi level. Uh, I'm not really going to get too much into it just because it's it's complicated 
and a lot of doctors don't use bilevel for whatever that reason is. Um, I can tell you that if you ever become proficient at managing bilevel or APRV, you know, you, you're on the next level of ventilator management. I, I'm not going to say I'm the best at it, but I, I think I'm pretty good. Um, but anyways, APRV is an inverse ratio, which is a longer I time versus E time pressure controlled intermittent mandatory ventilation with unrestricted spontaneous breathing. Now what that means is you're using pressure control, which means you're controlling the pressures. You have a longer inspiratory time versus the expiratory time, and you're allowing patients to breathe on top of that pressure and you're giving them pressure support to do so if they're able to i should say um a lot of times in this mode you usually don't want the patient to be breathing on top of it it just depends every patient's different um, patients that are kind of tenuous you usually you want them sedated pretty well and you're not allowing them to breathe on their own but like i said this is where the complications come in and it's based on the open lung approach to ventilation it was started in the 80s. Uh, Dr. Downs and Dr. Nasser have kind of really written the book on proper bilevel management. And so during the P-high, P-low, which is the peak airway of your P-high and P-low, you can the patient can breathe on top of that if they're able to. Now, you have what's called your time-high, which is where your is essentially your inspiratory time. So time high is the time in your peep high, and you want that time longer than your peep low, or that's also the time low. And what it does is it helps recruit under perfused alveoli, allows for longer time for gas exchange, and hopefully, you know, recruits the atelectatic part of the lungs due to an ARDS or whatever the reason is that doctors want to use it. So you can make changes based on your ABGs. And with the shorter expiratory time, you can have what's called an auto peep, which is pressure left in the lungs due to an incomplete exhalation. Um, in my experiences, I've seen that if you can keep your expiratory time, usually around between 0.6 and 1, uh, usually that's enough for... A complete exhalation, like I said, everybody's different and you may need to make adjustments, but you know, this one you kind of can allow what's for called permissive hypercapnia, which is you're allowing CO2 to build up into the blood because the oxygenation is more important than the ventilation portion. And in some in some hospitals and some doctors, and usually when you follow ARDSNET protocol, you know, 7.2 or better is is an acceptable number um, if the kidneys are working okay the sodium bicarb is going to buffer that number over time and you know the body will regulate itself at some point and we just use this as a treatment for ARDS and it prevents volume trauma in the lungs and that's kind of the gist of what it looks like um, you see the longer eye time, the shorter expiratory time, and then the little spontaneous breaths on, on top. I've never seen it look like this, but that's generally what it looks like. And that's what it would look like on a PB840. Um, I've never seen it look like that. Usually the rate is, is a little bit different, but um, it's just a demo photo. But there's the pressure support of 5, the peep high is 15 the peep low is five so that means your delta p is 10 um, if you hit them on the right breath you can see the pressure is actually 15 it just you know it just depends and you have to obviously suit it to you know maintain whatever you're trying to change and that's why i said it's very complicated sometimes so let's talk about how we would discuss ventilators in in rounds so if you have a patient who's intubated or trached on the ventilator you know you would i would say the mode you know prvc uh cis control you know the rate is this you know if you want to you can say well the rate's 12 but they're breathing 18 you know the target tidal volume's 500 the fio2 is this this is the peep um 
sometimes you can throw eye time in. It's up to you. Uh, it's if the doctor wants it. Um, and then and if you're an SIMV, you throw in your pressure support as well. Um, if they're in pressure support ventilation, just, you know, use your pressure support over your peep like you're reading a fraction. You know, your pressure support is 12, your peep 7. There's 12 over 7. Um, if the patient's on BiPAP, uh, you can throw in the rate if you want. A lot of the times you're going to set a lower rate because you want the patient to be breathing spontaneously on their own. Um, for some patients, you do want to set a rate, but you just worry about dyssynchrony and you know the lack of cooperation with them being on the machine in general. Um, and then you read the IPAP and the EPAP. Um, if they're in AVAPs, you can you say the volume in your eye time. And then, you know, the FiO2, and most of the time, you know, most orders default to uh, keeping the pulse ox above 92 or 94%. So, alarms. They're going to alarm. And the biggest reason why you're going to get peak airway alarms due to secretions, coughing, um, if they have a smaller airway, those can't go over. And then just overall ventilator to synchrony. Um, you can get a patient uh, disconnected alarm because at my hospital we have to change the ballards and the excretory filter every day. Um, or, you know, patient self extubate. You know, is it ideal? No, but it happens. Um, and then you can have tidal volume alarms due to, you know, patients taking deep breaths or shallow breaths. And that could be for a number of reasons. Um, alarms, they're not adjusted after placing the patient on the ventilator. Uh, you get them on there because it's an emergent situation, and then you just haven't had time to set your, you know, your parameters yet. Um, but you can do that relatively quickly, or they're just not enough sedation, and they're just breathing whatever they want, and you just need them to be a little more controlled. Um, some vents, uh, like the GE uh, Carescape R860, that has an end title module on it, and you can get end title alarms, and then you know you can have a low versus high end title CO2. Um, those do have low pressure alarms on there and that can be due to like a circuit leak, a cuff leak, or, you know, the patient's, uh, static compliance can increase and their, um, their numbers drop below whatever your low pressure alarm is. So, you know, let's just say we have a patient who's on a, uh, ventilator and, you know, you draw an ABG on this patient and this is the mode that they're on, you know, PRVC, AC, rate of 20, uh, tidal volumes 500, 1.2 is the high time, PEEP of 8 at 40%, and this is the ABG. You know, what do we change on the ventilator to uh, make sure that our, another, our next draw, you know, has a better, um, you know, more normal look to it? So, first thing you always want to do is make sure you're properly interpreting your ABG. In this case, it's a respiratory acidosis with a mild hypoxemia. Or it's a partially uncompensated or partially compensated respiratory acidosis with hypox mild hypoxemia. And so how do we change things? Well, in the case of the pH, it's caused by respiratory. So you want to change your minute ventilation and that's, you know, rate times tidal volume. And so you can change it to, you know, 24, 26, something like that. Um, change your tidal volume if you're not going necessarily by ideal body weight. Um, oxygenation, you know, that's PEEP, you know, increase your PEEP to 10. Change your FiO2, that's usually the easiest thing to do. Or you can make the eye time longer, which will help contribute to gas exchange. And let's see where you go from there. So just going over what I just said. Um, some people can say, you know, like if you're worried about time, you know, you can shorten your, your ex, your inspiratory time. You can, but if it's like 1.2 and in this case, the rate was 20, your total cycle time is three seconds, you know, 1.2 inspiratory time to a 1.8 expiratory time. Is it really going to affect your overall CO2 with that? Probably not just because in that time frame you should be having a complete exhalation. But generally speaking, that really works most with patients who are in an inverse ratio. And this is what an SBT looks like on the GE uh, Carescape R860. We use those um, at my facility. Um, this is how one of the doctors um, wants them done. Um, I wouldn't necessarily have the stop criteria be this wide. Um, 
I was going to change it when I put the photo up, but I completely forgot. So, um, but you can set your rate, your high versus low rate, minute ventilation and apnea time. And then you set the overall time. Um, each parameter you want to have like pressure support versus peep is just, it's different per every doctor. Um, some doctors use pressure support in place of tube compensation. Um, it just depends. Um, I've always done mine. If the doctor lets me make, the decision on how to run the SBT, I usually do mine zero of pressure support with five of PEEP, and I usually don't do tube compensation um, just to see what will happen. If worst case scenario, I'll do five of pressure support. Um, just because with tube comp, the waveform, I don't like the way the waveform looks, so with pressure support, it just the waveform just looks more even. But like I said, it's just personal preference. So when we're looking at weaning parameters, we want to have hopefully a good ABG. Um, the minute ventilation between 5 and 10, sometimes more, definitely not less. Uh, the frequency between 12 and 20, but some patients are different, like your pulmonary fibrosis patients. You want a NIF of at least negative 20 or better, um, especially with your myasthenia gravis, your guillain and also, it can be a test of their level of sedation. If they're not strong, and, you know, if they're not awake enough to follow that command, then you know, it may not be a good time. And then, force vital capacity. Um, I I have some reservations about the overall numbers. Some say between two and three liters for your average man, 1.5 liters or better for your average female. But if you're in like a trauma scenario with like broken ribs or belly surgery, you're probably not going to get that high of a number. Um, I usually go by two times or more of what the resting tidal volume is. I think even in my five years I've been there, the highest I've ever gotten is about 2,400 and a little bit more. And that was a big guy. So that, you know, you kind of want something better than I'd say, usually like one liter, 1.2, but it's, you know, patient dependent. Same thing with tidal volume. It's, you know, smaller people breathe less volumes than bigger people. You want a positive cuff leak because you worry about laryngeal edema. You don't want your patient to develop strider and have their airway close off entirely. And then commands, can they follow them? Hopefully the answer is yes. You know, TBI patients and neuro patients, that's a whole nother ball game. But let's just say for the sake of your average intubation or whatever that they can follow commands. You know, can they squeeze their hand? Can they lift their head off the pillow? You want to know, can they protect their airway? And then your rapid shallow breathing index. Um, the literature is less than 100. It's your frequency divided by tidal volume. It's just a ratio. Um, Dr. Eng, one of the trauma surgeons I work with, he prefers 75 or less. To him, it's just a better indication. Um, and in my experience, I really can't argue with him. It's It's true. And then if anybody has any questions, you know, leave one in the comment. Uh, if you like my content, subscribe, uh, like my stuff. I'm working on presenting more stuff and putting more stuff together all the time. Um, if anybody has any ideas of what they want me to do a video on, just send me an email, mediocrert at gmail.com. And hopefully I will hear from you soon. Thank you.